What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. Guys, I'm hyped. We got another space question today, which are always my favorite. You do love space. I love... Not only is it a space question, I get to do planet stuff again, which is just... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so fun. I don't know why specifically, like, planet formation is my, my new jam. You're like an expert on it by now. I am. I barely had to do any research for this. Just <laughs> kidding. There was a lot of new stuff. <laughs> this will not be a repeat of my other answers. So our our space question I'm excited about is... What if Earth had two suns, like that good Star Wars planet Tatooine, and probably a lot of other sci-fi planets? Probably, but that's the one people think about, right? Like, that's kind of the go-to. Yeah, there's that one. There's, like, one in Doctor Who, I think. There's, like, a, a, a more popular one in Doctor Who, but it, obviously it's a sci-fi trope. So what I went into for this one is, could Earth have formed in a solar system like this? So I'll start with just the short version of how planets and solar systems form, because I've come, this part I've covered a couple times, but uh, basically the quick version is the way a solar system forms is Big Bang happens, all this dust and hydrogen helium material is all around, and eventually it slowly coalesces together due to the gravity. The gravity pulls it closer and closer and closer and closer until, the set, until it forms like this big disk of dust and in the center of the du- center of the disk the dust compresses so much that the forces start creating fusion and the star forms in the center of the system and then the remaining dust around it kind of orbits lazily around that sun until that dust under its gravity slowly comes together and forms planets so in our two sun scenario in the center of the disk instead of just one big sun you kind of have two going around each other and the thing that thing that sucks for planet creation is that because these two stars keep moving around in the middle and dancing around, it really destabilizes the inner portion of the solar system where you know Earth would normally form. Because if the if the orbit path of the dust around the sun isn't nice and gentle and slow, it makes it really hard for these little planetoids to form. It's hard to get the building blocks of planets, and even when you get them, uh, if they're unstable they'll crash into each other and you know instead of creating planet they'll just be destructive instead of um i guess cooperative cooperative rocks (laughs) i like the word planetoid yeah planetoid it's basically just an asteroid but i but it's just like a pre-planet so it's tough to get them in the middle that's not to say planets don't form around two star systems once you get far enough away from the center the motion of the sun becomes a little bit more of a of a rounding error and you get more stable orbit. So further distances, you can still, you still get planet formations. The difference is if you are forming a planet far away from the sun, where it's nice and cold, the basic gases and everything that form the planets are cold enough that they actually freeze. And when you have planets that are made up of frozen gases, you get gas giants instead of rocky planets. So there are actual there are planets found that they found in real life in binary systems in the, you know, the habitable zone that we want. But it turns out the ones they found, they all theorize they're gas giants that formed further out and have migrated in towards the sun. So we could have an Earth in the right orbit, but it's the wrong type of planet. So the question is, could we in any way get a rocky planet in our solar system that would be more Earth-like? So if our solar system can't make a rocky planet, we'll just have to get one from somewhere else. In the Milky Way, there are billions of rogue planets that aren't connected to any solar system at all. And there are a few ways that these planets can kind of go rogue. One of the more common ways is that early in the solar system's life, when these planets are, for, you know, are first forming, and it's like, you know, things are still a bit, a bit messy, quote unquote, Planet collisions or gravity of much bigger planets can actually mess with the orbits and toss planets out into space, um, and they'll leave the so- they'll get enough velocity to leave their solar system, and then kind of drift around. 
and then they can be caught by, you know, up the gravity of another sun. Planets actually can form entirely isolated in space, so instead of being in the dust cloud of a of a star where it would be, where it would be happen most commonly, you can get enough random gases in, you know, in deep space in the void that would just come up together under gravity. And this is kind of, these planets are kind of interesting because they form they're basically failed solar systems because they don't have enough energy to create the fusion. And a planet made this way would actually be entirely made of hydrogen. So they're like orphan planets. Yeah, they, they're like, they're basically orphan Jesus planets because they don't really have a, like a sun mommy. <laughs> 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 or I guess a sun mom and dad in, in the in binary, in binary sun, in two sun solar systems. There's two more exciting ways that they can be, you can get rogue planets. One is they can be injected when a star goes supernova. I don't think those would be good candidates for our Earth for our earth because that would likely destroy any atmosphere that they have and you know most of the planet itself <laughs> because being in a supernova supernova is not an ideal spot to be for a planet and then my favorite is what they call hypervelocity planets which can be going anywhere between 7 and 10 million miles an hour through space and these ones form when you have a two star system and the star system gets too close to a black hole and the black hole sucks up one of the stars. And so one of the stars goes in the black hole. But during that process, the other star is slingshotted out into space, <laughs> taking its planets with it. And you can get planets from that uh, slingshot effect. Unfortunately, while I do want one of these hypervelocity planets to be the base of our Earth, if it formed a two-star system, it would be a gas giant anyway. So we're going to have to go with the boring one, where it just kind of gets tossed out of an early uh, solar system. So... The next question is, you have these planet, these rogue planets shooting around space at whatever speeds. What are the odds of our solar system actually being able to, you know, catch this planet and put it into our orbit? As far as the, what the actual odds are, I have no idea. But, <laughs> interestingly, there may be a rogue planet in our own Milky Way. And by own Milky Way, I mean, like, in our, in our actual sun, our own... What's our, just our solar system called? Just our solar system? Does it have a I name? I think we just call it our solar system. Yeah. I know never technically, heard it have a name. technically the sun is Sol, right? Like SOL? Yeah. Yeah. So in the Sol solar system. <laughs> That's annoying. <laughs> no, I'm Googling it. Um, Technically the Sol system. Yeah. The Sol system. Oh, wait. No, hold on. No, no, never mind. That's most science fiction. The The International <laughs> Astronomical Union... Uh, calls it the solar system and the sun. So never mind. <laughs> we are sucks. very uninventive. <laughs> All right. So in the so the solar system, capital T S N. Actually, no, S-N. lowercase t. Apparently. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so there might be a, and by might be more than likely is a rogue planet in our solar system, which is the elusive planet nine, um, not Pluto. It, Pluto is no longer planet nine. Planet Nine with a capital P and a capital N. <laughs> no capital T. No capital T. It's still, it's still considered a hypothetical ninth planet that may be caught in our solar system in a distance orbit. So it would be further out and in a very you know, very eccentric orbit. And so they had like, basically they, they quote unquote discovered this planet because they had some gravitational anomalies and orbit behavior in the solar system they couldn't really explain, but it could be explained by like a big object, you know, a big planet sized object. I think it's 10 times the size of Earth, you know, moving around in this weird orbit. And then they were like, hey, maybe. And then a few years later, they kind of predicted where its orbit might be. And in that orbit, they noticed a motion of a bunch of smaller space objects that would also be explained by a big Earth planet going through that. So it was like kind of a confirmation there. We still haven't seen the actual planet. We still haven't seen the actual planet because it... Because it doesn't emit light and it's very far away in space, it's really hard to see. Mm. <laughs> it's funny how that works, right? <laughs> yeah, it is kind of sp- space is kind of weird. Where it's like we can see all the suns and stars, but like actually, like a rock in the nothing is really hard to find. So they're pretty damn sure it's there. And I was reading a study that they're also pretty dang sure that it's a rogue planet that encountered our system. And so the researchers at New Mexico State University ran a bunch of simulations showing that if a rogue planet of that I assume, they didn't say exactly what the parameters were, but ge- I assume generally of that size and speeds. Say They say it would be captured about, f- in 40% of the cases, it would capture that rogue planet. So if a rogue planet came by, there seems like there's a good chance our two-sun system could actually catch it. The last bit about the rogue planet 
being, you know, quote unquote, Earth-like, is that the rogue planet, of course, is going to have to spend some amount of time completely away from a star. So probably not super conducive to life cr being, you know, created. But there is one factor going for us, and it's that our oceans are big, which saves us again, I guess. <laughs> it saves us a few <laughs> times. Sometimes it ruins us, but this time the big ocean saves us. Um, the University of, in the University of Chicago, a geophysicist by the name Dorian Abbott noted that if you had an Earth-like planet, the way he had done it, so, so if you had Earth and the sun suddenly went out was his original hypothesis, but if you had an Earth-like planet away from a sun, it would actually become insulated once the outer shell froze. And so if your oceans are deep enough, which Earth just would be, you would have kind of a kilometer thick ice sheet, but underneath that, from the heat of the planet, you would have enough insulation to keep the ocean below that ice sheet liquid. And you would have enough energy kind of around to harbor life. Microscopic life, to be fair. But it's a start. Yeah. It's once literally we get a start. To our nice suns, <laughs> once we get to our solar system, it starts heating up again. And then we can melt the oceans. And then we can have all our good dolphins and whales and giraffes and all the good animals. Get there eventually. So basically, we can't get a Earth by forming it in our own system. But we could theoretically steal one from space. We could adopt one. Yeah. That's a better way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, adopt is a much much more uh, clean way to say that, I guess, that makes us feel less weird about it. Well, see all those adoption vans running around offering free candy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, what did, you, uh, what did you cover now that we have an Earth? So now that we have an Earth, I looked at the different orbit options that we have because there are a few different configurations that are that we can choose from if we had the ability to choose. And the first one I looked at was something that uh, Marcus was kind of excited about at first. Now he sent it to me a while ago. I don't know if you remember, but um, it's a figure eight option. And it's a cool option just because figure eights are cool. And it's not really like something that you think of initially. But in order to see if this is possible, I had to look into what is called the Roche sphere. So a Roche sphere is basically the gravitational influence of an astronomical body. So... Like, if you have a planet that's within another planet's uh, Roche sphere, then it'll orbit around that planet. If it's outside, then it won't orbit around it. It'll just kind of do its own thing. Now, in a binary system where there are two stars, it's not called a Roche sphere. It's called a Roche lobe. And it's basically two Roche spheres, but they're not really spheres anymore because they influence each other. So they're, instead of, like, circular, they're more teardrop-shaped. And, like, the tips of the teardrops are touching each other. I don't know if you can picture that. It's basically just like a figure eight. And if a planet is within one of the sun's Roche lobes, then what that basically means is that the that one planet is going to orbit around one sun, that one sun. If it's outside of both of the Roche lobes, then what's going to happen is it'll revolve around both of the suns as if it was just one sun. So we want to see if that, like in-between situation where it's not rotating around one and it's not rotating around both but it's doing a figure eight around both if uh, we want to see if that's possible yeah basically if it can like skirt both lobes and like pass <laughs> off from one to the next each rotation right that's kind of the God, idea i hate the word lobe <laughs> it's not great yeah i'm not super happy about this but we will persevere skirt a lobe skirt a lobe <laughs> skirt the lobe frodo <laughs> <laughs> So technically, this is possible. Physical, uh, a figure eight orbit is technically possible. It's very, very unlikely, and it's very unstable. But if you imagine, like, it basically means that the planet has to balance exactly on the Roche lobe. And if, it, if there's any disturbance at all, then it'll f either fall into the Roche lobe or out of the Roche lobe. And it'll just do one of those other patterns. Yeah, and I think I think it's important to say when when we say unstable, it's not like it's wobbly, like it's like just, you know shaking as it goes around its orbit. It's that it's in this shape, and small deviations can make it just fall right. off the shape and do something totally different. A way to visualize it that kind of helped me visualize it was if you imagine the Roche lobes, if they're like re represented by bowls. So if you have two bowls next to each other, just touching each other, and they're both in a larger bowl. And then you have, if a planet is in one of the bowls, that means it's in its Roche lobe, then it'll just circle that one bowl. If it's outside of both of the bowls, 
inside of the bigger bowl, then it'll revolve around both of the bowls as if they're just one bowl. If it's in this situation where it's in a figure eight and it's on the Roche lobe, it's bouncing on the rim of the bowls. So it's possible, but if you like touch it, then it, it'll fall into either the small bowl or the big bowl. So that that kind of helped me visualize it. Thank you for your Roche Low Bowl explanation. How many more words <laughs> can we put onto this to make the best tongue twister ever? <laughs> Skirt Roche Low Bowl. <laughs> so yeah, it's a cool idea. It's technically possible, but it's not really realistic. So I wanted to look at more realistic options. Uh, and for that, I looked at just real life examples. So there are examples in real life of binary stars. There are a lot of them, actually. But the closest one to us is Alpha Centauri. It's the closest star system to our solar system. And Alpha Centauri has three stars in it. There are two stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, that are sun-like. So they're very similar to the properties of our sun. And those form their own binary system. And then the third star is Alpha Centauri C, also called Proxima Centauri. Um, and this is a small red dwarf, and it's like really far away from A and B. So they do still think C is technically bound by A and B. It just takes a really long time to revolve around them. So they think it takes around 547,000 years to orbit once around these. Still technically part of the solar system, though. But what we're more interested in is the binary system that A and B form. So like we said, they revolve around each other. And when they're closest to each other, they're 11 astronomical units away from each other. An astronomical unit is uh, about the distance away from our Earth to our Sun, which is about 93 million miles. Now, at their furthest apart, A and B are 35 astronomical units apart. So it their distance varies a little bit, but both of them do have stable habitable zones. So it, technically there could be a planet in there. If there was a planet in there, then life could form. There is a planet in the solar system or in the star system it's only there's only one that we've confirmed so far and it's proxima centauri b and it revolves around the red dwarf that's like nowhere close to the binary system so it's not really helpful for analyzing binary systems um, we don't know of any planets in the binary system orbiting around orbiting around a and b but um, simulations show that a planet could sustain stable orbit within these habitable zones. And the estimated distances away from these stars for like a habitable planet is from Alpha Centauri A, we would have to be around one to two astronomical units. And away from B, we would have to be around 0.7 to 1.2 astronomical units. So it's actually a pretty close distance to what we are from our sun right now. And in this in this scenario, the planet would just orbit around one of the suns. It wouldn't orbit around both of them. So it'd be that one bowl scenario. And they call this a non-circumbinary planet. They also call it an S-type planet. I don't know why S. I'm sure there's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many letters. It's like it's like Alpha Centauri C B S. <laughs> yeah. And in this scenario, we'd be pretty close to one of the suns but then since the suns are 11 astronomical units apart we'd be kind of far away from the other sun so it wouldn't be as dramatic as the picture you see in star wars because one of the suns would be like a tenth of the size so it's not really what we imagine so i want to look at other options to see if we can get closer to what we're imagining in star wars and the other option is if the planet revolves around both of the suns, so the, the big bowl situation is called circumbinary, and it's also called P-type. Also, don't know why it's P, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> don't know why it's P, but it is, is a statement you can make about the aftermath of a lot of fun days. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about fun, but sure. Well, days. Let's just go with that. So an example of a circumbinary star system is Kepler-47. And Kepler-47 has a yellow dwarf and a red dwarf, both revolving around each other. And in this star system, there are actually three planets orbiting both of these stars. Uh, there's Kepler-47 B, C, and D. Don't know why there's no A. <laughs> we don't talk about A. 
Yeah, <laughs> not anymore. About AIDS. <laughs> not since the accident. <laughs> They're also kind of like in a weird order. C is the furthest away. I think it's just the way they discovered yeah, them. Yeah, because C is ashamed of what did to A. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they found a whole bunch of A's and then realized that, that they were finding planets wrong. And they're just like, guys, just don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> yeah, so C is the outermost planet. And it's the only planet that's in the habitable zone of these of the star system. And it is a gas giant. So confirming Marcus's theory about gas giants. But research, do- research does show that if there was an Earth-like planet that existed in the habitable zone of these two stars, water could sustain in its liquid form. So technically, we could have an Earth-like planet around these two stars. And I think that's probably the closest we can get to this the Star Wars situation with the two rising suns or two setting suns, whatever. Two suns. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that that's what our orbit looks like. We could we have two options, but I, I like the P type better, where we're orbiting both of them. I like the P type better. <laughs> Strong words. <laughs> Roche lobe. Roche lobe P type. There we go. P type. Yeah. So uh, Ben, what does what does Earth look like for people living on it? Yeah. So so I was going to look at a few things, and then I wound up going down the rabbit hole of just how hot is this going to be? Uh, pretty far. Because it wound up, they're wound up being a lot there. So, my gut instinct was, if we have two suns, it's going to be twice as hot. Which, short answer, we pretty much get there eventually, sort of. But I'm going to sort of walk through <laughs> the steps to get there first. I I I I really relate to that sentence, Ben, because I oftentimes have like at the start of my notes, I'm like, here's the main question I'm trying to answer, like for me, I literally have written here, could Earth have formed in the first place? And I have written underneath it. Kind of, sort of. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> it's like, I know you want the answer. The answer is yes, but we're going to get there. So the first question is, how does how does a sun affect the temperature of a planet? And really, sort of what happens is the energy from the sun will hit the planet, and that planet's going to heat up to, to counteract that incoming energy, basically, right? It's going to balance out the energy emitted by the planet as infrared radiation and the energy coming in as sunlight. So we know the amount of sunlight that reaches our current Earth from our current sun. It's it's roughly 1,361 watts per square meter, which hilariously, the website I was looking at said, to visualize this, imagine lighting a small closet with about 13 or 14 100 watt light bulbs, which, not going to lie, doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. I will say this about 100 watt light bulbs, though. The fun fact I know about them is that they are the sole way that an easy bake oven functions. Oh, yeah. Basically, the way the easy bake oven was invented was that 100 watt light bulbs were just so damn inefficient that you could use the excess heat to bake cookies. Yep. It's pretty good. So anyway, we we, we have this this amount of incoming energy. So if we take that amount of energy and we multiply it by the cross-sectional area of the earth because that's how much and you know how much of the earth will be affected by that sunlight at a time we wind up with 174 petawatts of energy per oh wait this was per second petawatts how many zeros is that that is 15 zeros which is a lot so i believe that was per second wait how do I not have this number here? Hold on. Watts, watts is generally per watts second. Watts is per second, right? Okay, that's what I thought, but I, I didn't have it like fully spelled out. I thought I did somewhere in my, my answer, but I guess I didn't. All right, so 174 petawatts of energy. So we can use that energy to figure out what the like expected temperature of our planet would be. Basically, we need a couple of things. We need to know how much energy of that is reflected and how much is absorbed by the planet. Uh, to do this, we need to get the albedo, which the albedo is basically the amount of energy reflected by an object, and it's usually referring to a planet. So a completely icy or snowy planet where it's it's all white is going to have an albedo close to 100%, where almost all the light gets reflected. If it was completely dark, it would be close to 0%, where almost all the light is absorbed. We know Earth's albedo, it's about 31%, somewhere between, because we're definitely not, you know, fully white, but we're not all the way dark either. I'm trying really hard not just hear libido. I know. Say albedo. Every time <laughs> I read it, right I thought now? the exact same thing. Yeah. And it's not... Uh... How hot's the earth getting? <laughs> yeah. 
it, it is it is hilarious that there is a link between the albedo and how hot it gets which it, it you're right it's a it's a good joke anyway um <laughs> you're right it's a good joke. it's a pretty good joke to our podcast yeah uh <laughs> There is, there is also, there's a relationship between the temperature of an object and the amount of infrared ra- radiation it's emitting, um, which this is the Stefan Boltzmann law. Basically, that energy flow is a constant they came up with that's like 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 times the temperature to the fourth power. So it scales very quickly with temperature, as you might imagine. And because of that, we can use that incoming energy the albedo and that constant to calculate the expected temperature of a planet, which for Earth gives us 253.6 Kelvin, which is minus 19.5 degrees Celsius or minus 3.1 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may notice a slight issue here because that is not the average temperature of our planet. <laughs> Basically, this equation ignores the effects of oceans or atmosphere just because those very much overcomplicate the, um, the calculation because they will... I have created an equation to tell you the temperature of the planet. It ignores a couple things, though, because it's hard. In, <laughs> in astronomers' defense, most planets do not have liquid water or atmospheres, and it works pretty well for them in those situations. <laughs> but what I decided to do was... Well, and, and so the reason this, this happens is that atmospheres will trap in heat and, and you know, act as insulation. Oceans will absorb heat and hold it better than just, you know base air will so i basically took our expected temperature and the actual average temperature of the planet which as of 2019 was about 58.17 degrees fahrenheit or 14.85 degrees celsius and i i used the ratio between those to get a constant that would say sort of at least for our planet what the effect of our atmosphere and oceans uh is on that temperature so i found that our actual temperature is about 13.5% higher than the expected we get from that calculation. And I just used that going forward to, you know, correct for the atmosphere and oceans, basically. So how hot could our planet get before we're definitely going to die? So I'm going to be clear. We would die before this number because of just (laughs) raw heat. But this is where life could not form anymore on Earth. Which, this is a point, it's going to actually happen in about 1.1 billion years. And what's going to happen is the average global temperature is going to hit 50 degrees Celsius, which is 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And at this point, the oceans will be so warm, they start evaporating without boiling. And once that water vapor is just in the atmosphere, the UV light from the sun will split those water molecules and the hydrogen in them will leak out into space. And you need that hydrogen to form living cells. So... That's that's the point where we definitely cannot have life on Earth anymore. So the question is, if we had two suns and they're both current sun sized, would we still be able to have life on Earth? Uh, we go through that calculation again. Um, having two suns just gives us twice the energy. So instead of having, what was it? 1,361 watts per square meter, it's 2,722 watts per square meter. And you work through it and you wind up with an estimated temperature of 28.5 degrees Celsius, which adjusts to 69.3 degrees Celsius or 156 degrees Fahrenheit after doing that same atmosphere C constant. So yes, we could not have life on Earth with two current sun-sized suns. It just would not work. Conveniently, there is a way around this. So there is a link between the mass of a star and its luminosity, which is luminosity is, is that amount of energy coming out of it. And that, that link, we use it sort of in terms of our own sun, which is convenient for our purposes right here. And it's, it's the ratio between the mass of that theoretical star and the mass of our sun uh, raised to the 3.5th power. So a sun twice as big as ours is going to have about 11.3 times the luminosity. A sun half as big will have about 0.088 times the luminosity. So obviously we have to throw the needle a little bit there. And it works out that if you have two suns, with 82% of the mass of our sun, you wind up with about half the luminosity for each of them and therefore the same solar energy total. So if we had two suns that were 80% of the mass of our current sun, things would be actually basically the same. One other cool thing about this, we are so close to getting orange suns instead of a yellow sun. A star's color is based on its mass. 
And the yellow star range is 80% the mass of our sun to 104%. So we're just short of dropping to orange suns. In spite of that, one thing we would get, the mass of a star does also determine its lifetime, which it's, it's because the mass of a star is how much fuel it has. And you might think, oh, so a big, a big star means it'll last a long time, but it also determines how hot it burns, and it burns through much more quickly than the extra fuel you get. So the numbers I saw, a sun with, so our sun has a lifetime of about 10 billion years. A sun with 75% the mass of our sun would have a lifetime of 21 billion years. So we would get some extra time, not quite all of that, but a little bit before, you know, our sun turns into a red giant and we all die from that. Yay. I did see a cool thing, actually, is that apparently scientists are trying to look more, if they're looking for life on other planets, they used to always look for, you know, yellow suns because that's what we have and they figured that was the best bet. But they're actually starting to look more at orange suns because they're pretty close, you know, luminosity wise. But because they have that extra time, it gives life more time to form. So it's more likely that, you know, the conditions would be right somewhere in that billions of year time span for life to actually form. So that's kind of a cool thing I, I, I saw there. And then finally, I also look somewhat into whether or not we are suns to look like Tatooines. I had that same thought. <laughs> and on sheer luminosity, it's not really going to work, unfortunately. I couldn't somehow, you can find like every random detail about Star Wars somewhere usually. I could not find officially what the colors of the, the suns of Tatooine are. Couldn't you just like take a screenshot of it? And, so, like... well, the problem is, the, 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 the problem is there's like, three categories are yellow yellow white and white and that goes from 80 percent our, our sun's math mass to 210 percent our sun's mass those three categories and i can't tell exactly where where they fall as far as i can tell one of them definitely looks red the other one looks it looks white but a white star requires at least 140 percent of this uh our sun's mass and that would give like over three times the luminosity which would bake us immediately so that clearly can't be right we'd be a desert planet <laughs> right exactly Tatooine. yeah but no it would like burn to a center it would not actually work um <laughs> i i did it assuming yellow white and red and you can get if you do like the smallest yellow white star and biggest red star you wind up with 20 percent more luminosity than our current sun which would give an average Earth temperature of like 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a lot higher than what we have now still. So it would technically be livable, but it would probably be a desert planet. So I'm going to say that's probably what it is on Tatooine, is a yellow, white star and a red star. And we could technically get there, but it would be pretty bad. It would be incredibly unlikely because not only would you have to have exactly the right size suns, you would also have to capture the rogue planet. <laughs> this so, is also true. Yeah. <laughs> Tatooine could exist. It is just going to be the most unlikely planet ever. <laughs> yep. And that's basically what I have is is we could we could have a two-star solar system if we had to 82% of our current sun suns, which is better than I expected that to go actually. <laughs> yeah, sun. <laughs> Chris Yes. Are you ready for a would you rather question? I am. Would you rather have to ride a horse or a unicycle to work every day for a week? Only for a week. Only for a week. Horse or a unicycle. I feel like I'd be bad on both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've never ridden a unicycle before. I have ridden a horse, but it was only once. And it was like a very, very tame horse. And I felt like I was out of control. <laughs> like I had no control at all. All right. On ease of getting to and from work, the answer is clearly horse. However, there's another aspect to this, which is that you have to store both of them while you're at work. And it's much easier to store a unicycle than to store a horse. <laughs> also, I don't know which one's easier. Can you, like, having no real horsing experience, can you lead a horse to work? Yes, but you can't make him work. <laughs> hey ben ben have you ridden a horse before i have ridden a horse before i don't okay. like it very much but i have done it but you would probably be able to get to work i could i could probably get to work 
So the other thing too is that I I work about twenty five miles away. I don't particularly want to unicycle twenty five miles. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I might be locked in on this one because yeah. Thing is, it's only a week. If it was longer, then you might be able to learn some of these better. But but like a twenty five mile bike ride is a pretty long bike ride. Yeah, and well, I, I'm saying I'm for, that... for I'm saying it affects both of them. It affects oh, both the unicycle and the horse. I, probably wouldn't be able to learn how to ride a unicycle a horse would probably be easier to learn i'd imagine so yeah maybe not i wonder I, like i wonder how much of knowing how to ride a bike transfers to unicycle there's a lot of balance that i feel like is very unicycle specific yeah i also live in a kind of hilly area and i'm scared of unicycling on a hill <laughs> have either of you tried the unicycle i have never tried to unicycle i've never i have not tried a unicycle i kind of want to now though I feel like I would just fall immediately. Yeah. Well, it's probably one of those things where once you're moving, like, it's much easier to balance. Once I'm moving, I am much more terrified. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, here's the other thing about unicycles. It's really easy to hop off a unicycle. Yeah. Okay. I, right? Like I accept your point. <laughs> I guess failing on a unicycle is less dangerous than failing on a horse. Is it? I mean, yes, falling off a horse just by itself can injure you pretty bad. But I feel like you're, you're less likely to fall off a horse, though. You're, you're, you're much less likely to fall off a horse. But if you do, then it's more dangerous. I'm assuming you don't have to, like, break in the horse. Like, I'm assuming it's like a, like a you know, it is a trained, like, rideable horse, right? You're not, like, catching a wild stallion and <laughs> breaking him. <laughs> yeah, I guess Where'd so. you get that? The wilds? <laughs> hmm. So there's, there, is, there is the thing about, because it's just a week... The inconvenience of, of dealing with a horse for a week is, like, fun for that first week, I think. I, you're going to have to, like, get food delivered to your work and your home. Yeah, like, no, no, you have to do a bunch of shit, but, like, that, you have a fragging horse that you're hanging yeah. out with. I, 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 think, I think the answer is, so, okay, for my situation, clearly the answer has to be horse. Like, I'm going to go ahead and put that out there now. There's just no way I can't say horse with the distance I have to go to work. If we're adjusting for, like... If if you work, I don't know what's a good distance. Five miles away. I, 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 I'm two miles from work, so two miles feels. I'm like less. I'm less than a mile, so. Let's say let's say two miles. How wait hold on how fast can you just cycle go? <laughs> Imagine a bike speed. Yeah, I've never seen anyone try to like speed unicycle. How fast is the unicycle? It's always like tricks and the stuff. The average like that. speed for a twenty inch unicycle is five miles per hour. So that's pretty slow. Let's let's say let's say it's it's a 20 minute trip to work on a unicycle which would be like yeah it's like 2 to 3 miles, right? Yeah. Somewhere between 2 and 3 miles. So around Marcus's commute. So it's, it's like a 20 minute unicycle ride or I'm going to guess a shorter horse ride, right? You can just you can just have the horse walk. That's not hard. You can do that. You don't have to like gallop it. I mean, I've never galloped a horse before. I, it, the one time I did it, it was walking. Yeah. like that's, It's not hard to like walk a horse. A horse walks around four miles per hour. So that's like a, a comparable speed anyway. Slightly slower but than But the one time I did it, it was like the horse, like, it knew its path. It does this all the time. So it just walked its path. I didn't do anything. <laughs> I mean, I guess you do have to deal with the fact that you're going to be in the city, Chris. I could, I'm at least out in the burbs a little bit more. Yeah, I'm right in the city. I don't know. Storage would definitely be a huge issue for me. Yeah, you can't just like tie it to a bike bike rack, really, can you? No. Oh man, I don't know. So I feel like if you correct for distance, the answer is unicycle, because the storing a horse is just a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot involved there. I agree. Riding riding a horse is better. Storing a unicycle is better. Yeah. So it's just which which of which. I think that it's the sto the horse storage is enough worse than the unicycle storage that I have to go unicycle, assuming I don't have to go like 25 miles. Yeah, I think it's very dependent on your individual situation, whether you need to store or you need to travel easier. Yeah, but, but I think even even assuming you like have a home and like a backyard, storing a horse is like a lot of work, right? Yeah. Like, it's not, it's not just I have a space where I can fit a horse, so I'm good. <laughs> right. But, like, legally, I don't know where to put the horse in the city. <laughs> 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 so 
Something about that statement, I hadn't thought about it, but that's a hilarious problem. <laughs> where can I <laughs> legally keep a horse? I mean, there are some horses in Boston. I don't know where they keep them. Right. You got to find like like one of those places that have like the historic horse tie-ups. Like... Yeah, where they have the horse wagons. Yeah, or like some places they'll have like uh, so, sometimes a feature on like curbs. I haven't seen any in Boston, but I've seen pictures online recently where it's just like they have like a little, it's like a little metal half circle like coming up out of the curb where you would like tie up your horse if you, you know, rode your horse to the bar. Oh. Uh, when people are, are actually doing that pretty often. So I was like, I think if you find a old horse tie up, you are allowed to tie your horse to it. Cause like, what, they got to arrest you and be like, what'd you tie your horse up here for? And be like, well, it's a horse tie. <laughs> <laughs> like it's the thing designed to tie up horses what do you mean i can't use it and they're like that's aesthetic well how am i supposed to know that there's no sign so apparently it is legal to ride a horse down the street in boston except for unlimited access highways it's legal to ride it but is it legal to park a I horse feel like you must be able to park it somewhere i don't <laughs> i don't know I can't. Sarah, Sarah just Sarah just texted me from the other room saying it's called a hitching post. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I don't know. I can't. I'm I'm literally trying to Google like horse laws in Boston right now and just having a lot of trouble. I. All right. Let's let's. I mean, they probably let's... have like they rent a storage area or something yeah. for the people that do have horses in Boston because there are a few. I'm sure you could find a stable of some sort in Boston where you could keep your horse for some amount of time but it's only a week so it's not worth getting that i feel i think you probably have to though i guess i would have to if yeah. i wanted to go with the and horse there's not answer. one close to you then you have to commute to your horse to commute to work <laughs> that's true you take your unicycle to your horse to like, right. take the horse to <laughs> so, work so so i think i feel like at this point we've reached a point where we can make our decision right yeah, yeah? i yeah. know what i'm choosing all right do i have Chris? to do it for my personal commute or can i use the theoretical five mile commute do the theoretical then. All right, Chris, you're first though. I was going to use my own um, my own situation, and according to my situation, I think I would have to go with unicycle just because the storage is so tough. Even if I can find a legal solution where I like rent some storage unit or something, it's going to be really expensive, and it's only for a week, but it's going to be like a huge hassle for that one week. And I'm probably not going to learn how to ride the unicycle within that one week. Probably going to fall a lot, but I don't have to go far. I only have to go less than a mile. So, um, I mean, I don't really mind doing that for just a week. Yeah, it's fair. So the situation I'm in is that if it's my actual commute, it's going to take me at least five hours each way to commute by unicycle. <laughs> so I think I'm locked into a horse. <laughs> However, assuming I can scale down to like a, you know, three-ish mile commute, I would far rather have to deal with a unicycle than a horse. So... I guess that puts me in a vacuum on Team Unicycle, but personally, my own situation on Team Horse. So make of that what you will. So for me, I think I end up in the spot where I think the Unicycle is the less inconvenient answer and probably would be the better week generally. But I think I'm going to pick Horse just because, again, the week after you do this, do you want to be known as the guy who rode a unicycle for a week or the guy who like, whoa, why did you have like a horse that week? You're like, I just did, did it for funsies. <laughs> so I think I would rather have the experience of having a horse for a week than a unicycle. You're the guy that does stuff for the story. Yeah. Having a horse for a week is a story. Having a unicycle for a week makes you look like a quitter. So it's a, having a unicycle for a week is a, it's a cry for help. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a failed cry for help. You couldn't even commit to that. That said, I would actually, well, now I really do want to try a unicycle at some point. But alas, my I, I doubt I'll have much opportunity for that. <laughs> Why? You could just buy one. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably not that expensive. You know what else isn't expensive, Chris? Patreon. Yeah, hey, you, got, you it. got it. Got it in one. <laughs> Guys, go to www.patreon.com slash absurd hypotheticals. And click on that Become a Patreon button. It is just one tier, one dollar a month. Basically nothing. It's like not even money. Like you could just throw that out and might as well throw it our way. And with that, you get access to our bonus behind the scenes episodes that we do every month where we we do a lot. We've been doing a lot of new stuff on there. We had a guest on. We've done, you know, we review the last month's questions. We talk about how we make the show. Ben drank spicy milk. Lots of goodies in the behind the scenes episodes. Um, we last did week our, we did a... Oh, go ahead. 
Yeah, sorry. Last week, good. Thanks for reminding me. We did last week. We did a practice run of our hundredth episode to see if our ambitious plan was going to fail horribly, and we just did our very first try. Like you know, just dry run it right on the behind the scenes for everybody to listen to. So lots of cool stuff. If you're enjoying the show and you want just that extra episode, go on there. But either way, join us next week where we answer the following question. What if everyone was a sphere?